when I first had this guy on the podcast, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can see his handsome mug for the first time, because the first two times was on audio. And I'm proud to admit, Scott Fawcett, that I think I was the guy that kind of introduced you and all your wisdom to the world for the first time. So welcome back, man. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. You're certainly one of the first ones. It's funny. I was trying to figure out when I was on the last time, but it's definitely been a long time. So you were definitely one of the first ones out there. Well, this is the third. This is your third appearance. Um, it's Scott Fawcett. Oh, is it third? Nice. Yeah, third appearance. Um, this is folks, Scott Fawcett, the originator of Decade, the Decade Course Management System. We introduced that way back in the day. And um, God, Lee, you're a superstar right now. And you... Uh, on the doorstep of trying to qualify for the champions tour. You old and decrepit like me. What's up? <laughs> I have to tell you, it's funny. I feel every bit of 50 right now. It's unbelievable. I, you know, it's funny because I had two surgeries. I had surgery on both my elbows back in 2021. And then I've really just I, I, doing my physical therapy and rehab after that. I've always worked out, but that's the first time that I've ever been like, it's really important that I do this therapy. So the surgeries and everything take and then it just turned into where i've just been working out a ton so i'm actually in by far the best shape of my life right now i'm definitely the strongest um i actually just ran into como in in lifetime fitness working out and he was like damn dude you're getting jacked so <laughs> it's uh I, I do feel every bit of 50 but i am in the best shape i've ever been scott you know what you're full of lessons always and you've just given one i think unbeknownst to yourself and that's just who you are um and you were sharing how you know, we've just got to be disciplined about doing the mundane. And I'll never forget Russell Henley here on our putting green at my home club. I asked him about, he was drilling on like six footers for like three hours on the green, but six feet and in. And I'm like, Russ, I know the value of this, but you know, three hours straight, what gives? And he goes, Mark, I believe to be really great. You have to be prepared to do the boring stuff. Yeah, stuff that isn't sexy, basically. And you've just said so. You've got to do the rehab and you've got to do those things that, that really aren't that sexy, but they're very important. Well, I think that any of the motivational videos you listen to on YouTube, at some point, they're going to say that like success doesn't happen overnight. It's the commitment to just doing mm -hmm. the simple things. I mean, people ask me about like success all the time. I'm like, it's not hard. Just do your job. Do everything that you know you should be doing just do that and you'll probably be pretty successful. I mean, it's just so hard to do it. <laughs> You're the mathematician. Help me figure this out. Why? Because look, I'm that guy. I'll talk to a bright mind like yours. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then tomorrow I get wrapped up in the, in the urgency of life. And then the next thing I'm like, that stuff that sounded so important and so like earth shattering. Now I'm not doing it. And I'm wondering why I suck so badly. We're humans. I mean, honestly, like I, I definitely have come to realize that just because we have dominated this planet does not mean we're actually very smart. <laughs> I mean, it's like we got a couple of we got some opposable thumbs and we can speak. That's about the the extent of our awesomeness. Um, it, it really is amazing how hard like I, I talk with tour players all the time and try to get them all meditating. And I explain to them, this is not you're not going to feel any benefit of this for, I mean, months or years, potentially, even before it starts to click. But you've got to do this. This was Tiger's superpower. Nobody believes that on the planet more than me. And yet for my own daily practice, it's 10 minutes, man. How hard is it to just do it? I probably get it done about four or five days a week, but it should just be the first thing like I personally do every single day, but it's just so hard. Like you say, life just kind of gets in the way and you just get busy. It, 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 I feel like it's just busy and not quite as, as organized as you could or should be. Yeah. That meditation, you touched on that. I, I read a book by James Nestor. Well, I'm trying, I'm trying to get him on the show, but he's, he's <laughs> too big for us, I guess. Um, and he, it was called breath. And you know, the more I read this book and it was groundbreaking, folks should go and read it. Um, how breath is vital to life. Oh, Yet yeah. 99% of the world's population don't breathe properly. Then they wonder why they got tension and high blood pressure and uh, you name it, just a plethora of things by just not doing the life's most basic function properly. It's crazy if you literally just sit down. So, so Navy SEALs have something they call box breathing, which is mm -hmm. in for seconds, hold for four seconds, out for four seconds, and then no breath for four seconds. And you just keep going in this cycle. And if you can just sit down and literally do that for just a minute, 
like you will you will actually get chills like the you will get chills in your body just by actually oxygenating it getting the carbon dioxide or whatever it is out like it's it's unbelievable and again just taking some breaths and, and like i say tiger has finally you know when he was the, the day before his car wreck a couple of years ago he was actually on the course doing a course management lesson with jada pinkett smith mm -hmm. and on like the fifth hole she's like you know how you look so calm out there you just look like you're meditating and Tiger said, he's like, oh, that's exactly what it is. I'm trying to play golf in a meditative state. She's like, oh, that's so cool. And, you know, they kind of talk about it a little bit more. And then a few holes later, there's like a little snack session shop set up. And, and she says, you know, so let's talk more about the meditation stuff. Like, when did you get involved in that? And he was just like, I mean, when I was born. And so it's like the first time that he's ever vocalized. Yeah, I've been doing this forever. And so you see like monks and people that go sit in the caves for, you know, 20 straight years. And there's just things you can't learn without a, a discipline process. And it, as much as I hate social media and everything else, I think the best thing that's come from social media is the you know proliferation of podcasts where you get guys like Tiger or LeBron or people on, and they're actually finally talking about their meditation, their preparation practices, as opposed to like books are so curated and so intentionally written. I don't, I don't think they kind of get into the weeds like that. And, and so much of it, like it used to seem like super new age, woo woo -y to talk about meditation. And now it's almost becoming cliche, but just because it's becoming cliche does not mean that it's a bad thing. Like it is what the top, I mean, certainly the top players that I work with, it's the number, it's the first thing we talk about. Oh yeah. Well, look, I've always believe that good golf comes at the intersection of a healthy mind, healthy emotions, healthy physique, healthy spirit, and, and all of that stuff is applicable. And, you know, if you're tense, it's probably because, you know, one of the things is a little off and that starts with breathing and meditation. Okay. Well, um, I think at the end of the day, that, 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 that what the zone is, is technically just a moving meditation. Now, people, when they just accidentally get into the zone, just because they've got a good song stuck in their head or something like that, you can accidentally do that. But what people have to learn is you, you can, it can be intentional. Um, we literally think that Tiger was playing golf hypnotized back in the late nineties. Cause he just, he looked hypnotized out there. It was bonkers to be perfectly honest to see this guy. He did not look like he was there. Um, and now it's just like, Oh, this guy is just understanding how to play in a deep meditative state. And that's why he's just, so, I mean, back to Salatoris, that's the one thing we worked on from the Texas Salmon U.S. Junior in 2014. And then when he was, you know, making the turn at the Masters that first year when he still wasn't wasn't even a member, it was one of the most proud moments I've had as, as you know, a, an air quotes coach when the announcers are just like, I can't believe how calm this guy looks like. I'm like, this is what we've been preparing for for, you know, six years at this point doing daily work with meditation. And that kid does his job. He does it every single day. He knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. And then once you get out there and you're in the heat on, you know, worldwide TV, he's prepared for it. I mean, he's still freaking out inside, but he's at least aware of his thoughts and he's not going to just ruminate on them. And that's the key. Oh, goodness. You helping me down my own rabbit hole and you always do. Um, Perfect. You know, <laughs> yeah. folks, welcome to my world. Um, Look, yes, the whole thing originates down to the central nervous system. And you know, I know, a lot of folks know, you're either sympathetic or you're parasympathetic. And pressure yep. can drive you to the former, and that's not a bad place to be. So uh, let, let's leave that there. Maybe we can talk about this after you've Perfect. qualified for the Champions Tour. Now, you're on a tight timeline, my friend. Um, <laughs> so before we get to your Tiger 5, I just want you to share some insights for the listener because you're not going to get good if you don't practice, right? Yeah. So what would you recommend? I'm sure you've got some mathematical equation for divvying up time appropriately if you're on a golfing deadline. I mean, for me, it's going to be entirely about trying to drive it as well as I can. So usually I normally do that. But then, then honestly, just making sure I'm hitting iron solid, I feel like the flight and everything else will take care of itself. But so for me, again, with limited time, I've, I, I, I played some good golf this summer and then I tore a muscle in my ankle the, the last week of July. And so I've literally played three times now since July. I've hit balls about probably 10 times, um, but I'm finally close to being able to go full speed. But I've got literally three weeks from yesterday until the first round of Champions Tour Q School. And so at best, I'm going to play eight or nine times. And so my practice time is going to be entirely focused on trying to hit the ball decent and then speed control and putting. And then with chip shots, it's literally just about like just not hitting bad chips. 
I actually posted this not too long ago when, when Jeff Smith was working with, with Victor Hovland, mm -hmm. I did a little bit of work for him on like some just stats and what can we work on? And I was like, honestly, for starters, can you get them just to not hit bad chip shots? Like I know mm -hmm. Joe Mayo is getting a ton of credit right now, which he obviously deserves for everything, but like Jeff deserves a lot of credit for just getting him turned in the right direction. Also, obviously Joe and Jeff work closely together at TPC Summerlin. Um, but for me, it's going to be just like Javi, like I'm just going to try to not hit bad ships. And I know that sounds funny as a plus six handicap who's going to champions to her Q school. But like, if I'm going to make it, it's going to be because I hit 85% of the greens. It's not going to be because I go off with my short game. I am giving a lesson later this afternoon. Um, it's not a course management lesson. It's more of a playing situation where I'm going to put a golfer in uncomfortable environments because this individual does very well in practice, but you add the modicum of pressure to the things and stuff kind of comes apart. So I'm a believer in that if you want to improve, you've got to put yourself in that place because you'll eventually draw some sort of comfort in there. And I'd sent him a text with two messages in it before the afternoon. And I'm like, I want you to consider these two things. Gary Player always said to me, he goes, hit every shot as if it's the last one you'll ever hit. Now that, it's not a podcast right now, but you will, if it's the last shot I'll ever hit, I'm going to really give this thing. It's the utmost attention yardage, the whole, you know, all your decade stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the Hogan quote was this shot's value is only as good as the next, or basically the next shot is the most important shot in golf. Now I want to drill down on what you just said there. You're like, look, I just don't want to hit bad chip shots. Right. So if I chip it to 10 feet, it's still decent because I can still make the 10 footer for par. So I'm not going to belabor the fact that I have a shortcoming here. You get where I'm going? hundred percent. I mean, where I thought you're going with that question is so much about like the, what you're saying, the next shot being the most important. So we track a stat in the decade app called the mental scorecard. It's from Dr. Michael Larden out of San Diego. And it's basically just black or white. Were you paying attention? It's a self-reported statistic. So it's a little bit flawed, but were you, did you know exactly what you're doing? Target shape, carry number. And when you pulled the trigger, were you fully present? And I thought, I think presence used to just be like this woo woo -wee mythical word also. And it just means, are you distracted? Are you actually there just focusing totally on the shot? And so what we've got, so when Zalatoris and, you know, like Doc Redman and a few other like tour players tracked this stat in the app, I, you know, I feel comfortable. We've had conversations, Mavericks, another one, just some really smart guys. So they're not letting the outcome of the shot impact how they rate it. But so every time that they have what we call a negative mental scorecard event, it costs, it's about a quarter to a third of a shot. That and most that. of these guys. Yeah, I mean, we obviously know it's not zero shots, and we obviously know it's not a full shot. Every once in a while, you still hit it good when you're not paying attention. And so it kind of intuitively makes a little bit of sense, too. But when, like, guys, again, like Maverick and Will started tracking it, their mental scorecard was 90%, meaning about 10% of the time they were saying, I wasn't really paying attention. But the math then becomes very simple. If if we can go from, let's just say, a 70 scoring average, and that means seven shots around they're saying I wasn't quite paying attention. If we can get that from 90 to 95%, we're going to drop that to three and a half shots around. And if it's a quarter to a third of a shot, we can now kind of pretty well say paying attention is going to save you about at, at the 70 shooter level. Like it, the number just gets bigger, the worse you are mm -hmm. at the 70 shooting level though, just paying attention is at least a shot in, in value. And it's, it's something that once you understand, like the data is like, it's, it's very straightforward and very clear. You need to learn how to pay attention. And it's not something that just magically flips on when you step on the first tee. So a lot of what Gary Player was saying there is similar to Tiger, probably practices really slow and really intensely, but a 30 minute intense session is light years better than a two hour, not intense session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And boy, but it's hard to do. I mean, it is hard to do, but that's why you got to do it in practice to then have it be easier on the course. Oh man, you've got that thing. I dealt with this with my brother, Trevor, when I was working with him. Um, I got hired and fired fairly often. Um, how where uh, it's just, but if one's good, two must be better. You know, I'm hitting it good. I gotta hit more now because I've got to galvanize this thing. Where someone like a Jack Nicholas was like, if I had a few good shots, I was done. I was out of there and I worked on something else. And what's really funny is actually when people are practicing and they're hitting it bad they typically start practicing faster because they're like, I just want to hit one good. So I was actually playing with a tour player. We're going to do a practice round four or five years ago. And he was hitting the balls behind me. And I kind of heard it clanking a little bit. And I was just kind of like, 
you know, just listening. And I just, I heard the pace just picking up a little bit. And I was like, and again, this kid had just gotten out of college and was just getting started on his exemptions. And I was like, slow down, dude. You're, and he's like, I just want to hit one good. I'm like, I hear you, but you've got to slow down. You're, you're just not going to magically happen. Oh man, I'm going to use that this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate Perfect. you. I'm sure the folks listening and watching are too. All right. Um, I'd hit you with, I want to talk about the five biggest course management mistakes that you've encountered in all of your lessons. And you're like, that ties in perfectly with my Tiger Five. Yeah. So talk about the Tiger Five and let's go through this stuff, please. Not surprisingly, Tiger's a smarter person and a better golfer than I am. When, when I was playing professionally in my 20s, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, like I would finish every round of golf and think I, sh I should have shot two or three shots better, whatever it is. Like everyone, you always, no matter how good you get, I think when 80 shooters, like when I can just average 73, I'll never be mad again. And it's like, no, you're 73 average. Your 75s and sixes feel just as bad as your 82s and threes do now. But I used to just laugh at all the dumb stuff I do. And, and Tiger basically started taking notes of like, why do I feel like that? It wasn't because I you know missed the green with the four. And it's because I did what are the, however many of these things. And then I think he started basically going through those notes to figure out what's the most common things. And so what he came up with was how many bogeys on par fives, how many doubles, how many three putts, how many bogeys with nine iron or less. And I like to say just bogeys from inside 150 now because some of these irons go too far. And then what he tracked was blown easy saves, which again is obviously subjective to his opinion. So for the decade app, we track uh, two chips. So how many times did you just miss the green on a chip shot? And what's crazy is, again, if, if you think back to your last round or when you play your next round and you, you're going to for sure walk off the course and think you should have shot lower. I mean, if it's not one of those five things, you're kidding yourself. Um, now, when it is one of those five things, you should do them some. I mean, again, so Tiger wasn't trying to have no three putts. It's not too many. So what Tiger of those five stats, he basically knew and gosh, dang, somehow he was actually right. He uh, he figured if he could have six or fewer of those per tournament. So one and a half a day, again, it's not none, one and a half of those mistakes a day, he figured he would win. And, and we were able to actually run the data and not including blown easy saves. Uh, the, the average player that finishes first to fifth place on the PGA Tour, which we wanted an indicative number of a solid finish. So like if DJ wins by eight, I didn't want that to start distorting the data. So just the top five, the actual number 6.4 of those mistakes so it's like they are doing tons of dumb stuff. You don't get to just finish around and be like, I shouldn't have made that bogey with a gap wedge. Like, did you make three or did you make one? Or how many three putts did you have? Again, and, and so what I try to tell players is when you find yourself in a spot where it could be one of those five things, just be aware, like, Let's also, yeah, I, I want to get a look at birdie here, but I also don't want to make bogey from 120. Uh, you know, the, the PJ Tour average from 120 in, in the fairway is like 2.9. Like, I don't need you to make many birdies. I just need you to not make stupid bogeys. <laughs> and then. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to do this because I couldn't write fast enough. Uh, and you kind of blew <laughs> through the five. And so. But I talked fast. Uh, well, I'm, you're talking to a South African. Goodness gracious. We invented that. Um <laughs> Again, for posterity's sakes and for folks really to meditate on this, because I want you to say these things and then I want you give them a beat so folks can go, okay, let that settle in my soul. I've got bogeys on fives. I've got blown easy saves. I've got doubles or worse. Eliminate doubles or worse, yeah. yeah. No three putts. What was the fifth? Uh, bogeys on par fives, doubles. Yeah. Three putts, bogeys with nine iron or less, so inside of 150 yards, and then blown easy saves. And and, and for the not so advanced golfer, that bogeys from inside 150 could be bogeys from inside 100 yards. Volume yeah. Six. And again, what we're really just trying to get people to do is just start analyzing it in a productive way. Again, when you, again, like when I was 25, I'd finish and I'd just think, God, I did so much dumb stuff. And it's like, well, did you really, again, if it's not one of those five, it probably actually wasn't that dumb. It's just, again, what I try to tell people is if you think you should have shot lower every time you play, you're either not as good as you think you are, or you made strategic and mental mistakes. Most of the bogeys, most of the Tiger five things typically tend to be strategic or mental mistakes. We weren't playing patient, disciplined golf. But then also there's sometimes with, you're making bogeys with a seven and like you're probably just not as good as you want to be yet and that's okay that's why we're always trying to get better in this game but don't beat yourself up and and almost as importantly when you're out on the course 
you can just so easily be thinking I could be two or three better than I am. I mean, at the Texas Open this year, I shot 64 in the first round and had the lead. But what was funny is I, I, I made the turn a couple under, and then I made a bogey on a pretty stupid bogey on like 11. And then I put myself in a really bad spot to about make bogey on 12. And so now I've already, again, I teach this stuff for a living, man. <laughs> I've now already gone through the mental gymnastics of how I'm definitely making bogey here. And I got a hard par four coming up. I'm even par in my head. And I'm literally on 12 and I've basically already talked myself into that. I'm going to shoot even par and I catch the thought again. That's the meditation is catching the thoughts like, well, that's really dumb thought. Let's move on. And then I wind up birding that hard par four and birding the last three holes to shoot 64. So I go from, I'm going to shoot even being such a negative Debbie downer to actually shooting 64 and having the lead. Like this game's so hard. It's ridiculous to play correctly consistently. Yeah. Okay. Look, you you are a fountain of information, and I love talking with you. I'm surprised I have not, when I'm in Texas, cornered you for beers afterwards. Because it, please it's do long term thing. Um, or margaritas. I I, I want to drill down on this a little bit because look, the no three putts. You talked to the fact that you were going to work on lag putting. Now look, strokes gained has proved that if you drive the thing longer, it's gonna your proximity of approach shot will improve. That goes without saying. But not everyone can necessarily drive it longer. They can pick up maybe a little power or at least make sure that their hard ones aren't in the woods. But I feel like everyone has got to hit a number of putts with a putter in hand. And the first place to start, given average proximity, is making sure that your lag putts get inside of a three or four feet to make the next one easier. Your comments. Well, the best way to think about it is on, on the PJ Tour from outside 30 feet, the best putters get about 75% of their first putts within 10% of the length of the putt. So for 40 feet, they're going to get three out of four inside of four feet. But that's four feet long or short or left or right. Like that's an eight foot circle. It's a really big circle. Once again, you you get your, your mindset correctly around it's okay to leave putt short. In fact, from 40 feet, you should leave exactly half of them short. That would be the way to optimize the average length of your second putt. Um, so for me personally, I think it's really interesting. Stop. I, I, I love you, Scott. And yesterday afternoon. <laughs> At least somebody does. <laughs> okay. Uh, yesterday afternoon, because your point that you've made, people are listening and they're like, I, I, I'm listening like a, I'm listening like a fan now. And I'm like, geez, he's just told me that from 40 feet, that if I've left the ball short half of the time, I'm maximizing the chances of making my second putt shorter, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what you said. And then, then you know what I thought about it was the very first time you were on the show, and you leveled the explanation that I still use. I used it yesterday afternoon in a lesson <laughs> with a young lady, wildly talented. She might be my daughter my oldest um and she's getting a little pissy about a pitch shot that she had from green side that hit and released some and rolled to like 10 feet in practice and i'm like you don't have a rifle you have a shotgun and you shoot a pattern and now i'm reciting scott Fawcett's lesson to me way back in the day because <laughs> there is this pattern of shots that you hit and if a golfer can honestly own that and know what your pattern is it's going to liberate you in the biggest way to be able to actually swing freely. So please share that for the folks who don't know it. Well, and that's, you know, like Dave Pels's deal where you should hit the putt 17 inches past the hole. I'm like, that's correct. If you can control your speed to the inch, which nobody can. So what you're talking about, there's a shot pattern. What you want to do is go out and find a pretty straight, pretty flat, about 20 foot putt and just put a ball mark out there and just take 10 balls and just try to roll it on top as close to the ball mark as you can. And then just on each putt, just move it off to the side. So you're going to create your shot pattern, just basically of distance control. Yeah. And you'll see it's going to be, I mean, three or four feet deep, probably depending on your skill and the speed of the greens and whatever. But like, once you start seeing that and you're like, well, if my shot pattern is four feet deep from 20 feet, if I don't leave any short, I'm going to have a four footer coming back. The four foot make rate on tour is only 88%. So that means I'm going to three putt from 20 feet if I don't leave any short. But if I start leaving 25, 30% short from a mere, again, a mere 20 feet, now all of a sudden I've traded that four footer 
for a one and a half foot short putt. And now my longest putt is about two and a half feet coming back. But then also what you've done, if you think of like a normal distribution curve, you've centered the, the inner 50% just past the hole. So you've made the hole as big as possible for the vast majority of your putts. You've now also optimized the average length of your second putt. Like that's how putting works. And that's, I know it's weird to use Will Zalatoris as my poster boy for putting. I, I get it. His stroke isn't that pretty. And I get it. He's not that good on short putts. But also at the end of the day, last year, that putting stroke was dead on zero strokes gained on tour. That is a dead on average putter on tour. And he was also second in approach putt performance, which is the average length of your second putt. That dude from outside 15 feet is just trying to tap in his next putt. And somehow the hole gets in the way. And he's actually above average in make rates from 15 to 20, 20 to 25, and 25 feet and longer. I had a Will Zalatorisism. I have actually covered him some before injury, quite a lot on the golf course. And one of them was the final round of the PGA at Southern Hills. In fact, it was he and Cam Young in the same group. Yep. And Cam Young actually had the lead on the 16th. Folks forget that. Made double there. And Will hangs in there, but made some clutch pass saves coming down the stretch. And when it when we were walking to scoring, because now my producer's like, stay on him, because there's a potential playoff. I'm walking along there, and Will is moving at the speed of light to get to scoring. And he walks past me and he looks at me and he goes, who said I can't putt? And I was like, no, not me. Uh, and, and, and I was like, I, I recount the story because everyone will pick on, oh, there was that wonky stroke I saw on social media and he's missed one or two short ones. You know what? If you throw that stuff out the window and go, it's just me and my shot pattern, he's going to make something when it really means something like he did at that PGA. I mean, again, his, I get it. There's other people I'd rather have him put a four footer for my life. But at the end of the day, last year, again, he was 3% worse than tour average from three to five feet. Like, it's not like it's 20% worse. It's 3%. Cool. And and what's funny is you have two and a half putts from three to five feet a day. He's seven or 3% worse. Like it's seven hundredths of a shot. It's, it's literally nothing. Now, what I've always said about Tiger is like, yeah, if you filmed every single golf shot I've ever hit, you could make a pretty amazing highlight reel. I would look like Tiger Woods. The opposite of that is true for Will. If you film every single putt every tour player hits, they would look like idiots because they all miss these little short putts all the time. Now, when you throw in the fact that Will's stroke, I get it. Again, it's not very pretty. Now, all of a sudden, it becomes a story, but it's like, Everybody else does the same thing. And I mean, again, that's why I get so frustrated in defensive form. I mean, obviously I defend him like a son sometimes, but it's like, it's just not that bad. It isn't pretty, but like the announcers, you know, when Jim Furyk first came out for like the first announcers five years. Bar Mark Immelman, please. Would you qualify What's that? your observation? The, the announcers bar Mark Immelman, please, please, please qualify your, <laughs> your observation. I'm just saying the announcers, when Jim Furyk came out, the first five years, they're like, well, he's going to have to change this, 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 and this. And finally, after five years, they're like, you know, he seems to stripe it every single year. I think that they'll, you know, they'll get there with, with Will's putting eventually. Cause it's like, again, I get it. It's not pretty, but also it's effective. Like it, it does work just fine. Obviously the guy's, you know, been one of the top 10 players in the world out there. I mean, you can't do that if you can't putt. Exactly right. Okay. Um, awesome. That, that was the uh, three putt avoidance thing. Um, I want to make a little course management thing out of this. And whenever I get the chance, I hop on this for not even just the club golfer. This is for the elite golfer also, because I'm on the fairways alongside these dudes when they are playing well and in contention because CBS covers golf on the weekend and I'm not following someone who's just made the cut. Okay. Yeah. And more often than not, I catch a dude in the fairway and I love it when you get the encore sound because then I don't have to say anything. And <laughs> the last watchword from the caddy is like right at the TV tower or inside edge of the TV tower or they picking some target. And then all I do is I color it going, by the way, the TV tower, tower is 20 feet left of the flag. Yeah. Because the caddy is going, uh, dude, I know you're styling right now, but let's just line one up over there. And if it blocks you close, if it doesn't, you're putting. Please, that's a course management thing. I know you can shed some light on. Well, that gets to the shotgun pattern you were talking about earlier. Again, I know what shot you want to hit, but it's it's imagine, I, 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 even though I'm from Texas, I've never shot a shotgun. I assume there's probably about 50 BBs or pellets or whatever you call it in a shotgun. If you fired it at you know a, a piece of paper, 
it would make a, a round, large pattern. And now the way golf shot patterns work is we don't get to hit 50 shots at once. Yeah. So I know which one of these pellets you want to come out, the one in the dead center. That's why we would aim a rifle exactly at it. But you just don't know which of those 50 is coming on any given shot. And so you have to, you don't need to allow for the entire shot pattern, but you need to make sure like 80-ish percent, again, this is all relative to your abilities, but 80-ish percent of your shot pattern needs to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be done, again, simply by picking better targets. I mean, to your point about, about on tour and they're not aiming at all these flags, Tiger, it was in San Diego. I don't remember if it was the US Open or just the Farmers, but Tiger and LaCava were being interviewed right after a round. And they said, what was the best shot of the day? And in unison, immediately, they both said, oh, the three iron on whatever the long par three is on the back nine, the three iron on 14, whatever it is. And when they said that, I was like, I'm going to get into shot link because there's zero chance what they both said is the best shot of the day. And it was a three iron. There's no chance it's within 30 feet. And I logged in and it was 42 feet exactly pin high of the flag. And it's like, that, that was his, they like, they both said that was a laser beam where we were aiming. So his target was 42 feet right of the flag there. And it's like, here's the goat just picking off par threes while everyone else is trying to draw a little three iron back into the corner. And it's like, it doesn't work. <laughs> I've never, ever in all of my days in golf, and I'm older than you, yeah, by a few years. <laughs> uh there's two things i know for certain i've never seen the hole come back to a ball all right and i've never seen a bad three on a scorecard ever 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 so if I you mean, like, golfers if you're on par threes jason day one year when he was the number one ranked golfer in the world i asked him about it at the end of the season and he goes you wouldn't know one of my goals was to average three on the par threes and for the season, he averaged 3.01. So I was like, my follow-up, as you can imagine, I'm like, all right, well, you're aiming at bunches of flags. He's like, mm -mm. straight down the middle of the green. Let my putter be the superstar was the words I heard. Well, and it's funny because the year that he gained, I think it's probably the most strokes ever on the greens. It was like 1.1 something. He had a, yes, he putted well, but he also had a disproportionate amount of, of 20 to 40 foot putts. And he ran a little bit hot in that category where it's like he had a, a, a he made had a nice make rate on these putts that whenever you make one, you're gaining just a huge amount. And if you just throw in one extra of those a tournament, it's like an extra quarter of a shot, which it just doesn't seem like that much. But, you know, one of the things I was going to say earlier when you were talking about like my own preparation, I don't really care if I two putt from 60 feet, 60 feet, like coming up in Q school, I would like to, but realistically, if I have many 60 footers, I've got other problems. And it really is funny when you're tracking your stats as you play and you pace off putts, it almost doesn't matter like where you hit it. It's like, Oh, 27 feet, 24 feet, 34 feet. Like it's just incredible. Again, as a, as a good player, how many putts you get from 20 to 40 feet. So yeah. my goal is to not three putt inside of 30 feet and then to not three putt much from 30 to 40 feet. And if I'm outside of that very often, again, it just doesn't, it won't even matter. So whatever. So I am focusing in on that 20 to 40 foot range. Like you can't imagine in, in my speed drills and speed work. Fantastic. Um, along these par threes, three lines, um, I'm a recovering college golf coach. I was one of those for 20 years. <laughs> and I have a twitch because of it. Um, <laughs> People have asked me if I ever want to do it. I'm like, no, <laughs> okay, well, uh, thousand percent. No. Yeah. Um, I always preach to my golfers and maybe this was, I had a moment of clarity and I, this came out of me, but I was irate. I remember the first time I said it, it was post round kind of analysis and I was just watching. I didn't have data. I didn't have Scott Fawcett and decade at the time. And I said to them, I'm like, you idiots. If you just had to make a couple fours in the par fives and threes in the threes, you have the nucleus. You have almost half of your round under par because there's four fives and four threes. That's eight holes. So I'm like, if you make fours on fives and threes on threes, you're on your way. Then you just got to be average on the other holes and you're shooting anywhere from 74 to 68, whatever. And they, they joked about it. They're like, here comes MI. It's going to tell us about fours on fives and threes on threes. Even worse now is one of your things, the tigerisms, bogeys on fives. And yeah. I would even go worse. If you start to log sevens and stuff like that, that is oh. round 
wrecker. So let's so talk about the management of the fires, please. Well, again, it's just always like, I, I get it. This hole is more birdieable than another hole, but unless it's number one at Riviera, it's probably not playing under 4.5. I mean, you just don't find that easy of par five. So an easy par five is usually like 4.7 ish on tour. Like, I could stand on the tee box and bet every tour player a hundred bucks. You're not going to birdie this hole. And they'd be like, I'll take that. And like, I would print money all day. And it's just what, what people do is they stand on a tee box and they, they kind of prime themselves by, okay, here's a birdie hole. Again, it's birdieable er, but it's still not a birdie hole. And then they hit a bad tee shot and they're like, well, I got to get it back up there into play. I got to get it to 80 yards so I can have a little lob wedge into this thing. And they try to bite off way too much from the trees or from the rough. They leave it in the trees or in the rough. And now they're making six. And, and one of the, one of the most interesting data points to me is that the difference in 80 and 120 yards, I can't be, I should look at some, it's either 0.1. I think it's 0.1 shots. It's either 0.1 or oh. 0.15. So if you'd ever asked me how much easier is 80 than 120, I'd been like, oh, light years. And it's like, no, I mean, until you can get to where you're basically pitching the ball. So let's call that 30 yards and in, mm -hmm. like you're probably going to hit it to 12 or 15 feet and you're probably going to miss it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I have modified my approach fours on fives. I'm like, yeah, fours on fives are helpful, but just you want to avoid the nasty stuff because you, you you've you haven't been patient you you haven't been judicious in your shot selection as you've approached this par five well i, I worked with nick taylor a, a number of years ago for the first time and, and he contacted me i don't remember why but he it was the week of uh of uh pj national and so we were i was just going through his round and he you know he'd hit it on the water on 18 a couple times with three and i'm like what are you doing your club head speed's 111 you're 270 i assume you've got to catch a perfect three wood to get it there he's like yeah i mean i just see everybody else getting there so i just feel like i've got to get it up and around the green i'm like well dude that's not it They're like you you can't take those penalty shots on well so we talk about discipline on par fives and he actually goes then to uh to innisbrook next and he he i think he played the par fives 11 or 12 under which was the record for how much they'd been played under par to that point and he called me just glowing. He's like, that is unbelievable. I'm like, well, also, let's don't get too carried away here. You just happened out of the 16 par fives. You hit 14 of the fairways. Like, yeah. that's just kind of convenient. Overall, your fairway average was the same what it should be for the week. You just happened to hit them all in the par five. So you got it all up and around the green. I'm like, I don't want to rain on your parade, but it's also just not that easy either. It's like, that's, I talk about winning requires luck all the time. And, and like a lot of times it's just about, I just happened to hit the par five fairways this week. And that's a huge gain. I, I'm, I'm so glad you would say that um, because it's a syndrome. You know, you get these longer holes. I would even venture into a long par four, which plays like a par five. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you would be standing on the tee with someone going, all right, uh, this is 450 into the wind. There's water all over the show and it's riddled with bunkers. I mean, if you play this thing in two over for the week, you're probably gaining strokes on your competition. Okay. Um, but I find a syndrome in this power era in which we live where golfers get on certain holes, par fives for this argument, where they're swinging for the fences on shot number one. And from there, they're caught with their pants down and they're ostensibly trying to avoid now making a mistake or bogey or worse on the hole. Well, again, obviously the main thing I always talk about just ad nauseum is hitting stock shots with the driver. Like don't try to hit it harder. Don't try to flight it. Don't try to shape it opposite of what your stock shot is. Like just do the same thing over and over again. And it's interesting because actually yesterday when I was playing, I came up onto a hole that was downwind and it's downwind like 15. It just felt like one I could just send one on. And I, I was thinking about trying to swing harder. And then I was like, no, dude. I mean, what am I really hoping to get an extra 15 yards if I happen to catch it? But on average, also with the extra spin, I'm going to put on by miss hitting it more often. Like I'm not actually going to net hit it any further than just my stock shot. And, and it is interesting just to kind of hammer, because that was the one thing when you were talking about potentially talking about the top five mistakes, course management, I, the number one mistake people make is dropping back from driver too often. Like I'm just going to get this three wood in, in the fairway. Just, you should be hitting driver so often it's sickening. And that's one of the things that you can see on the PJ tour. It's pretty funny how just everybody's just like, my God, they're hitting driver everywhere. It's like, yeah, send it figured out after you do. And, and the main reason we talk about this, the one shape is driver's the only club in the bag 
that's fit for a shape. So I fade driver. So when I go to a driver fitting, like I'm just hitting my stock shot. It's not like they say, okay, now hit some draws for me. And so now I've got a 2200 RPM cut driver. If I try to draw it, it's going to be a mid teens knuckleball that's going to fall out of the air. Yeah. The flip side is if you're a drawer, driver set up for that. Now, when you try to fade it, it's going to be some sort of a 3000 RPM spinner. You might as well just hit three wood or preferably mini driver um, <laughs> if you've got one of those in, in either case, like just go ahead and hit a hard three wood. If the hole really doesn't suit your shape, hit a different club. Don't try to shape the driver the other way. Love it. Um, you've opened up an avenue for me to look down. Um, the mini driver. I'm seeing the proliferation of those things in the biggest way. And Tommy Fleetwood has uh, professed to me that like he feels he's the uh, the inspiration for all of the stuff going on because he brought one out at the Masters a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I, be I beat him by two years. I actually asked TaylorMade for 10 heads and they wouldn't give them to me. And I'm like, why? And they're like, it's sold terrible. Um, we don't want them in players' hands because then people will ask for it. This was before they reintroduced it. And yeah, I was like, yeah. I promise you, I will get someone to win the Masters with one of these clubs. I guarantee you that will happen in the next couple of years because of 2, 10, 13. You don't need 3-wood at that course. I mean, if you're hitting 3-wood maybe into 15, you probably shouldn't be hitting 3-wood at it. There, you just don't need a 3-wood. And Mini Driver, because it's 300 cc's, it's just so easy to hit. It's ridiculous. And yeah. it's not like a three woods hard to hit, but it's harder to hit than this mini driver. And so personally I go driver, mini driver, three iron. So yeah, I've got a huge gap. I carry three iron about two thirty, but I carry this mini driver like two eighty. Yeah. I mean, so I've got a huge gap, but I'm like, I only drop back to an iron on the tightest of holes and there's just not going to be much stuff, especially on the senior tour qualifiers and everything where I need more than two thirty. So I think it's gonna be fine. Well, well, I'm asking this for the club golfer. I, I feel like this disease, this disease of diminishing loft is catching out a lot of golfers. You don't have Scott Fawcett's speed off the tee. So, <laughs> so they're going with these low lofted long irons. I'm like, I've got more chance of seeing the Messiah than you hitting this thing properly under pressure. I mean, uh, and I'm like, get a hybrid or something, make it easier to elevate this golf ball and make your decision making a ton easier. So comment there, please. Yeah. I mean, Bryson, the first time that I, I worked with Bryson, I mean, I, he attended my seminar in college right before he won the US Amateur and NCAAs and everything. But then the first time I actually saw him hit a ball was between those two wins when I caddied for Zalatoris at the Pat Coast Am in Eugene. And the first thing I did, because I was just curious, I wanted to see what his long iron looked like being single length and it just looked like a putter. And I'm like, will you hit this thing for me? And it was just the lowest bullet you've ever seen. I'm like, that's not going to work on tour, dude. You're going to need to find a five wood or a seven wood or something. And, and, and again, that's kind of where you're going for the average player at home. If you can't get the long iron, it's, it's really interesting. If you look in your bag, typically for people that like they're three, four, five, and maybe even sometimes six irons, they'll start to all kind of go the same distance yeah. because we don't get enough launch and spin on one of the two. And so it's just funny how it's like, I I've asked a number of people before, like how far do you carry your five iron? And then a couple holes later, I'll say, how far do you carry your four? Iron? And they actually say a shorter number sometimes than the five iron. I'm like, do you realize that's the problem here? Like you've got to get a hybrid, like use the technology. I, I personally struggle with hybrids with just the bulge and roll face. But also, I've got, like you say, I've got enough speed that I can get a flat face three iron up in the air. But man, if you can't, again, a five wood, a seven wood, some of those things are so simple to hit. It's ridiculous. Ah, the seven wood is becoming almost standard issue on the PGA Tour right now. I really yeah. hit it. They, they yeah. hit the driver hard. Then from there, they're trying to get the thing in the air. All right. Mm -hmm. um, well, Tiger's five, we've, we've sort of gone through them. We've done some course management stuff. You've talked about practicing. We've covered it all here scott and i've kept <laughs> about 45 minutes um I, I want you to before i ask you to just share where folks can get you just kind of put a bow on the conversation leave the parting shot shoot it please you know i'll, I'll put the quote that Stuart sink said after he won you know that 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 making better decisions just takes the mental energy like like again just running decade as a script it takes the mental energy that used to be required to make a decision. It just makes it for you. But my point with bringing that up to your question is making good decisions is really taxing, but it is, again, it's, it's, it's the backbone of when you think you should have shot lower. It was either decision-making or you're kidding yourself. And 
that's just the discipline. Again, Tiger, quite obviously, in my opinion, is the goat, but he just he absolutely destroyed people by thinking better. And that's just course management. There's a great Raymond Floyd quote from his book where it says like, even if we had the exact same skills, I would beat you 99 times out of a hundred um, just by playing the game correctly. And it's funny. I don't know whenever I was playing my twenties, I don't really think I thought of it as a game. I thought of it as a golf swing. Um, I did. I certainly did. And yeah. It, and it's, it's just, and, and what's sad it was it was in the interest of being better. I felt like to be better, I had to improve my golf swing. Yeah. And so like taking Zalatoris again, who I've just, I've known Will since he was nine. He, he was a, a, he moved from San Francisco right whenever I had corn fairy status. So we played a lot of golf. We did a lot of chipping games, always screwed around on the range. And I just always remember watching him and thinking, I don't know why you don't crush every tournament you play in. And again, when he was a junior, he was literally ranked 3,300 in the world when he graduated from high school in junior golf, not even amateur golf in junior golf rankings. And just by making better decisions, this kid literally got, I mean, he was number three in the world in amateur rankings at the, in, in September, like literally four months later. And it's just like getting a little confidence by making a little bit better decisions. He used to try to, because he hits it so well and puts it poorly. He was always trying to make birdies with his approach shots. And it's like, actually let's avoid bogeys with your approach, approach shots and just trust the birdies are going to come there on the par fives and probably the short par fours. Like that's, that's the way it works. Everybody gives Craig Ranch a hard time because the winning scores in the mid twenties every year. I'm like, you have four reachable par fives and you have two somewhat drivable par fours to what you were saying earlier, like a third of the course, they're good holes, but they're going to play under par. Mm -hmm. And it's unusual to have six of those again. Like you wouldn't stand on any of the holes and be like, this is a bad, dumb hole. Like you've got to hit good shots, but on average, you're going to do well. And somebody's going to do well on all of them. Yeah. So it's not that the course is bad. It's just that it has a disproportionate amount of, of scorable holes. It all just comes back to patience and discipline every single time and not trying to force things like that's when you start focusing on score, you get overwhelmed with what's the winning score. What's the top 10? What's the top 25? What's the cut? Just all these things that are essentially irrelevant information. And it's just distracting you from the real point is just to sit out there and play and think clearly and not make emotional decisions. So true. I shared earlier that I've never seen a bad three on a scorecard. Well, you know what, folks? If you make 18 fours in a round of golf, you're going to shoot 72. Oh. <laughs> fours I mean, are not that bad either, are they? <laughs> no. I mean, again, doubles are just killers. The, yeah. the way you've got to think about it is, if let's say that we've got a hole that, that is playing under par. It's playing at 4.7 on a par five. If you make birdie, you picked up 0.7 shots. You didn't pick up a shot. You've got to start thinking of everything in fractions of shots. Now, the flip side is, let's say we've got a hard par four playing at 4.4. Yeah. Well, if you make bogey, you didn't lose a shot. You lost 0. 0.6 shots. Mm -hmm. And importantly is you not only can just gain and lose shots fractionally or lose shots fractionally, you only gain them back fractionally too. So now if all of a sudden I actually make a double on that, well, it was a hard par four. I made double, whatever. It's, it's two over par instead of one. Well, actually you lost 1.6 shots instead of just 0. 0.6 shots. You actually lost almost three times as much. So this is not necessarily the best math. It's just more of a logic thought problem here. Um, but making double is typically, you know, three to five times worse than making a bogey simply because you can also only gain those shots back fractionally. I right. get it. You, you technically make it back a full shot in birdie and par parlance, but birdie par bogey is all irrelevant. It literally is what's the field's average score and how am I competing? Technically if a, a 72 hole score of 280, like my average score is, 70 yeah we can break that down into every single shot it doesn't just have to be because four rounds it's over now we break that down in every single shot and again once you start thinking in fractions of shots you just realize how valuable every single shot is yeah on this very podcast you know there was one stage when webb simpson was playing that he was leading par five scoring on the tour and so i asked him about it because he's not a bomber by any stretch of the imagination so i asked him about this and he talked about his strategy on par fives and then he said to me, but you know, the most important thing is that when I make a mistake, I just ensure that it never costs me two. And, and that, that was a score observation. But then he also said to me, he goes, because, you know, the tournament is finite. There's only so many holes. And if I make a double, 
then that's going to take me one more hole to try and somehow get that back. And to your observation with the fractions, it's actually more than that. So it just speaks again to making sure you kind of avoid disaster every time you play. Well, and again, every time you come into a tournament with a, with a this is what the winning score is going to take, like maybe approximately, but really what we do know is on tour, the winning score is going to be roughly 12 to 14 shots clear of the field average. Mm -hmm. So when Cam Smith won the tournament of champions a few years ago, he was 34 under. Well, he was 14 shots clear of the field average. Like that's a very consistent number. It's actually amazing. Um, Zach Johnson, the year that he won the masters, everybody's like, he didn't go for a single par five. It was amazing. Kind of an important footnote to that story is nobody went for a single par five that week. It was miserable. It was cold. It was raining. And he won at one over par. He didn't win the masters at 20 under while not going for a par five. He won it at one over par. Like yeah. that's important information to, to, to give to people to be like, well, you don't have to go for par fives. Yes, you do. <laughs> Unless it's cold and miserable and nobody else is. Fantastic stuff. All right. Kept you for a long time. You need to go and practice. Okay. <laughs> on a tight time. Before I let you go, Scott, tell folks where they can find you, where they can get decade or everything, please. Best spot. We finally have optimized it. Uh, we finally have it decade.golf. You can go there and you'll be able to buy it as a gift coming into the holiday season. We finally actually figured out how to pull that off. Obviously get it for yourself. Uh, my Instagram is decade underscore golf. Luckily I finally did surrender and punt Twitter back in April. And uh, that has been the best, the absolute single best decision of my life. <laughs> I don't think I realized how much it was taking out of me, but Scott, yeah, so am, Twitter no am, more. Uh, even in your exhausted self, I'm thankful to you. And I'm thankful <laughs> that you would first off that you would look at the game like you do, but then more importantly, you would be so prepared to share all your wisdom and your insights. So thanks for joining us. Hey, 30, 40 years of frustration in this game. I got to help people not do the same thing. Amen, brother. <laughs>